We are in the Gospel of Luke, continuing in our verse-by-verse study of the New Testament here on Sunday mornings. Wednesday nights, we're going verse-by-verse verse through the book of Exodus. But here's Sunday morning, and the Gospel of Luke tonight will be in Revelation 21, as we're just two more chapters before we're finished with Revelation. But this morning, Luke chapter 7, we'll be reading verses 36 through 50. And the message this morning is entitled, Jesus Saves the Best for Last. So Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, where we read, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, Well, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who touched him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Well, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, Well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you gave me no water for my feet. But she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven." And those who sat at the table with him began to say uh, to themselves, Well, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So again, here Jesus saves the best for last. Because in this chapter we've read how Jesus healed a man from a distance. He wasn't even there in the same place, the same room, the same house. But he spoke the word and the man was healed. Later on, Jesus raised a young man from the dead. And uh, that was amazing. You know, if you want to have a successful funeral, don't invite Jesus to it. (laughs) So he ruined the funeral, and the young man arose just as Jesus said. And then later on, he healed many people, cured blind people, deaf people, cast out demons, raised more dead. And John the Baptist was told from his prison cell what Jesus had done and how truly he is the Messiah. But then here Jesus saves the best for last. He forgives the sins of a repentant sinner. But in this story, we also read about this Pharisee, this man, Simon, not to be confused with Simon Peter or, or the other Simon who was a disciple of Jesus. is somebody completely different. Simon, a religious ruler, a Pharisee, one who adhered to the strict legalistic ways of the religious rulers. And in this story, we see that sometimes we see things in others, but we fail to see or we're blinded to the things that really are in our own hearts. And there's a story that illustrates this point. See, a man went to a barber for a haircut to a shop that was entitled The Best Barber Shop. The barber thought highly of his shop. So the man walks in and says, I need to look my best because in two weeks I'm traveling overseas on business. The barber said, well, what do you do? The man says, well, I work for a company XYZ and we sell such and such. Oh, that'll never sell, especially overseas. By the way, where are you going? I'm going to Italy. Oh, Italy. Oh, it's so crowded. It's so dirty. The, the food is awful. You'll have a, a horrible time there. What, what, what airline are you flying on? He said, well, I'm flying on transcontinental air delta jet lines. <laughs> oh, they're awful. They're horrible. The worst flight record in the business. Horrible service. Disgusting food. Nothing but turbulence there and back. You'll probably get airsick. By the way, what else do you intend to do in Italy? Well, 
I was hoping to, to actually meet and, and talk with the Pope. What? You're crazy. Only the most important world leaders get to see the Pope, and only by special invitation. There's no way you'll see the Pope. At that point, the man remained silent. The barber finished his haircut. The man paid him, and off he went. About a month later, the man came back to that same barber, and the barber recognized him and says, Oh, well, how was your miserable trip to Italy? man said, honestly, it was the best trip of my life. The flights were as smooth as silk. The service was top-notch. The food was excellent. The sights in Italy were much more impressive than I had even imagined. It was easy to get from place to place. It was uncrowded. My sales presentation went better than what I had even hoped for. Their purchase resulted in my biggest commission ever. And I got to meet the Pope. I got to kneel before him and even kiss his ring. Well, the barber, he was just dumbfounded. And, he, and finally he said, well, what did the Pope say to you? Well, the man said, he looked down at me and said, son, where did you get that awful haircut? <laughs> the best barber, right? Pride. I thought that was really funny. So anyway, pride self-righteousness, that barber found faults and flaws in everyone and everything other than in himself, all the while oblivious to his own failures. Just like this man Simon, the Pharisee, who clearly saw the sin in another but didn't see the sin in his own life. And therefore, because of that, he couldn't even see the righteousness that's in Jesus. In verses 36 through 38, we read that Jesus receives a repentant sinner. Let's look at verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees, we find out later Jesus mentions his name, Simon. One of the Pharisees asked him, asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, in their culture, especially at that time, when someone invited a guest to a meal, there were certain protocols that were observed. First of all, a servant would be stationed at the front door with water to wash the guest's feet. People wore sandals or they went barefoot and the roads were dusty. And so this was just a common courtesy to refresh a person, wash their feet so they could enter in. Also to keep your own floors clean. Then some fragrant oil would be poured on the head of each guest and it would run down the hair and onto the clothes. For several reasons, two of which being that since it was very dry... Not humid like here, but very dry, kind of like Arizona. You hear people talk about Arizona and New Mexico, how it's a dry heat. Well, that's the dry heat they make beef jerky at, by the way. So I don't want to be there. But in Israel, the weather is very dry, and so that oil would help soothe and and coat and what have you. Also, it would be fragrant oil that would drip down into the clothes. And, uh, you know, if somebody kind of had a little body odor, that that aroma would mask the person's body odor, thus making the meal much more pleasant. At that point, then the host would greet his guests with a kiss, one on each cheek, that holy kiss that we read about in Scripture. Well, this Pharisee, Simon, who invited Jesus, provided none of these common courtesies. And that was very, and it was intentional, it was very disrespectful to you. Hey, come to dinner But really, Simon revealed from the get-go that he wasn't interested in honoring Jesus. He was just trying to find fault with him, trying to check him out, trying to find some way in which he could blame Jesus. Well, that night, though, an uninvited guest showed up and did for Jesus what the Pharisee failed to do in the most respectful, the most giving, the most loving way possible. Verse 37, Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. We don't know what her sin was. Some suggest prostitute, and maybe she was. But she was a sinner, and she, it was notorious. Everybody knew this woman was a bad gal. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. We do not know the identity of this woman. Someone might say, but wait, later in another gospel it talks about Mary anointing Jesus and the disciples getting upset about that. They saw it as a waste. That's true. Mary, the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus, did anoint Jesus, but she anointed Jesus' head. 
This is a different woman at a different time earlier from that, and she anoints Jesus' feet. So two separate anointings by two different women, and we don't know the identity of this lady. When we get to heaven, I'm sure the Lord will point her out and say, that's the woman who respected me and loved me and, and poured her heart out to me. So great testimony. Looking forward to meeting her. So she uh, comes there, um, and she stood, verse 38, at his feet behind him, weeping. Now, to understand the positioning of the bodies here, it's important to understand how they ate back in those days. In fact, still in many cultures to this day, uh, they would have a low table that was shaped in kind of a horseshoe manner. And people would recline on pillows and usually lay on their left side and use their right hand for scooping up food and and eating and all. Now, the guest of honor was positioned here at the uh, end of of the horseshoe. All of the dinner guests would lay with their heads toward the table and their feet sticking out backward. This woman came behind Jesus weeping, her tears Uh, washing his feet and then wiping his feet that she had just washed with her tears with her hair. She was so overcome by the guilt and the weight of her sin. But she didn't just stay guilty. She did something about it. She knew Jesus could help her. You know, a lot of people that feel guilty today, a lot of believers who are carrying around unnecessary guilt You know, we've been washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But yet, since that is true, why is it there are still believers who feel guilty? I suggest they have not done what this woman did. They have not done what this woman did. Therefore, they are still feeling guilty, still feeling shame. But today, we're going to give us all an opportunity to do what this woman did. If you're feeling guilty, and I don't need you to raise your hand. God knows who you are. You know who you are. You're carrying around something in your heart, some burden in your soul, and you just feel this crushing weight upon you, and and you don't know what to do. You've tried so many things, but but yet nothing. What are you to do? Well, this morning we're going to give you an opportunity to unload yourself, to cast your care upon Him because He cares for you. To take his yoke upon you. Let go of your yoke, your burden, your guilt, so that you can receive the blessing, the forgiveness, the joy, the peace that only Jesus can offer when we come to him as this lady did. We'll read on. What did she do? Uh, Verse 38, in the next part, it says, She began to wash his feet with her tears. Wipe them with the hair of her head. And you're thinking, oh, do I have to cry and use my hair to clean the floor or something? No, no, no. You're not going to do that. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, she knew she was a sinner. She didn't come to Jesus and say, you know, I've kind of been bad lately. But when I was a kid, oh, man, was I walking tight with God. Let me tell you about my baptism. Let me tell you about my parents who sang in the choir. Let me tell you about all the wonderful things I did at camp when I wrote my sins on a piece of paper, cast it in the fire, and we joined hands and sang Kumbaya. Oh, it was great, you know. No, none of that stuff. She didn't say, I'm a Baptocostal, Luther, Episcopalian, whatever. She said, none of that. No affiliation whatsoever. She didn't present to Jesus what she had done She came with one purpose, to mourn and grieve over her sin. You know, Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Such blessedness in mourning over one's spiritual condition, realizing, man, I'm a sinner. And not just kind of a sinner, I'm a real sinner. Jesus died for the sins of the world, but he also died for my world of sins that I've committed. And so she came mourning. And boy, was she ever comforted. God comforted her. Notice that she uh, not only washed his feet with her tears and then wiped him with the hair of her head, but she also anointed his feet with fragrant oil. 
anointed him with fragrant oil. What were the results? Well, number one, Jesus had pretty smelling feet. Number two, because she was the one touching him, anointed him, she took on the very fragrance of Christ. And then number three, that fragrance of Christ permeated the entire room. What a beautiful picture of worship. What a beautiful picture of a a child of God coming to the Lord to really worship Him. Heartfelt, sincere, broken. It beautifies the name of Jesus, but it also takes, that, that worshiper takes on His fragrance as well. And then that worship then permeates the entire place. And that's what worshiping Jesus as this woman did will accomplish. Now, sometimes there are those like Simon who are critical of the worship of others. And they kind of have this, oh, what's, what's that guy? What's she doing? Why are they, you know, and, and who do they think they are? Mr. Spiritual, Miss Spiritual, you know. But they're like Simon. And that aroma that the person is casting off becomes offensive to another, to the critical person. We need to be careful. We need to be very careful if, if we find ourselves... If, now, I, I can understand if somebody jumps up and runs around and is distracting, then obviously they need to be duct taped to their seat. That is true. You know, They're not to interrupt the worship of others. But if somebody's lifting their hands or standing or kneeling or what have you, and they're not bumping into one another, there's nothing wrong with that. There's something absolutely right with that. It's expressing worship to the Lord. And the critical people need to remember what the Holy Spirit through Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Let me read it to you. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And it's interesting. You can be in a room. Some people love you. Others hate you. If you're a Christian worth your salt, some will love you. Others will hate you. The aroma you give off will be very pleasant to some because it's the aroma of Christ, but yet that same aroma of Christ will be offensive to the non-believers because to them it's not a fragrance of life, it's a fragrance of death. To the one, verse 16, we are the aroma of death leading to death. They're realizing, hey, you know, this Jesus he's preaching is condemning me and I don't like it. But to the other, the aroma of life leaving or leading to life. And so by virtue of you coming to worship Jesus, by virtue of you walking with Him, you do emanate some aroma. To the believer, you are an aroma of life. To the non-believer, you're condemning aroma of death, and that's why they don't like it. Now Simon, the host Pharisee, did not like what he saw or what he smelled. He was repulsed by this woman's worship. So in verses 39 through 50, Jesus rebukes a self-righteous Simon. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. Who did he speak to? Himself. Who did he speak to? Did anybody else hear him? No. Spoke to himself. He was speaking to himself, and that's important to remember because in just a moment we're going to see that Jesus hears our thoughts. And so he spoke to himself saying, well, this man, speaking of Jesus, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. You know, we need to be careful about what we think because Jesus hears our thoughts. The second point I realize is that Simon says, you know, this woman is a sinner. How did he know? How did he know she was a sinner? Anyway, verse 40. Jesus answered and said to him, so now he's answering Simon's thoughts. (laughs) He said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so he said, just short, matter of fact, oh, teacher, say it. Go ahead. What's on your mind, Jesus? Verse 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. And the other, 50. A denarius was a day's wage for a laborer. So one owed 50 days wages, just under two months. And the other owed 500 days wages, about a year year and a half of wages. 
And so they both were indebted to one particular person. And when they, the two that were indebted, had nothing with which to pay, he, the creditor, freely forgave them both. The guy who owed 50 and the guy who owed 500. Jesus said, tell me, therefore, of which of them will love him, the, the, the one who they owed money, which of these two indebted guys will owe or will love the creditor more? And Simon answered and said, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he, Jesus, said to him, duh. No, he probably didn't really say duh, though it may be implied in the original Greek. But really, it was kind of, well, no kidding, you know. But Jesus, much more gracious than I am, verse 43 said, You have rightly judged. You're absolutely right. The one who owed more and was forgiven the most will be the one who expresses the most love, the most gratitude. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? What do you mean, do I see this woman? Of course I see her, that sinner of the city. No, 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 no. Do you see this woman? Yeah, she's the one who had... No, no, no. Do you see her now? Do you see where she is right now? See, we have a hard time forgiving and forgetting. But praise God, Jesus doesn't. Praise God, he has no hard time at all. Simon didn't see the woman who was now being cleansed by the Lord, even though she was cleaning his feet, yet he spiritually was cleansing her soul. Jesus saw her completely different than Simon did. And guess whose opinion matters? Simon's or Jesus's? See, if you come to Jesus like Simon, not thinking you have much sin, not needing much from God, and just, you know, casual matter of a fact, Lord has nothing for you. There's nothing for you. But if you come as the woman, even if you've had a horrible past, if you come to Jesus broken, mournful, giving to Jesus what you can, not not money, but just your heart, your soul, your sins, if you give those to him, he will see you totally spotless, Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. He will see you sinless in his sight now and forever. Others will look at you like you're a sinner. You're bad. You're whatever you might be. Or whatever they think you might be. But remember, the only opinion that matters is Jesus's. And when you've come to him by faith, he forgives you of everything. He holds nothing against you because everything you did, past, present, future, was nailed with him to the cross. So do you, Simon, do you see this woman? And then Jesus said to Simon, I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. Again, Simon the Pharisee didn't even offer the least of common courtesies, whereas this woman went up and beyond hospitality, doing the absolute most she could do, not holding anything back. She washed Jesus' feet with that which is most precious to God. Very precious to God. Our tears are very, very precious to God. In Psalm Psalm 56, verse 8, You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they, my tears, not all in your book? Wow. God keeps record. He has a storehouse of of tear bottles. Some have, you know, this big, others a five-gallon bucket, others who cry a lot, they got storage containers, you know, just full of tears. And every single tear is precious to the Lord. Every tear that we cry in mourning, in grieving, in shame, in, in, in sadness, every tear we cry, the Lord captures those things. And he writes them down in his book. Why? I don't know. But I see that one thing is true. Our sorrow, our grief, our tears are very precious to him. 
very precious to him. And she washed Jesus' feet with that which is very precious to him, her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair. Now again, we don't know what sin she had committed or had been committing. Some do suggest that she was a prostitute. If so, in their culture, women had their hair covered unless they were prostitutes. And with their hair, they would expose their hair, thus revealing to the men that they were ready for business. That was the sign. You know, uncovered hair, prostitute, ready for business. What she had, if that's true, if, if, if she was a prostitute, then think about this. What she had been using for sin was now being used as a sacred thing in worship of Jesus. Talk about glorious repurposing. Have you ever heard of repurposing? People will take old decrepit wood from a barn and they'll, they'll make something beautiful with it in a new home. Repurposing it. Well, here this woman was taking that which was used for sin and now is being used in worship of the Savior. It is so wonderful when people repurpose their gifts, their talents, their abilities. Instead of using them for self-glory and attention or selfishness or sin, they then devote those things for the sole purpose of glorifying God. Has God given you a gift, a talent, an ability? Is there something that you're able to do? What are you using those gifts, those talents for? Who are they glorifying? The Lord or yourself? God invites you, like this woman, to use those things for his glory, for his purposes. And you will find that when you do so, oh, your gifts, your talents, your your abilities become something wonderful, something eternal, something something glorious. Hey, maybe you're not a streetwalker, but are you using what God has given to you for his glory or your own? So then in verse 45, he says to Simon again, you gave me no kiss. Now, as a man, I'm happy when no men kiss me. That's a good thing, you know. That's our culture. There, though, you know, men kiss each other on cheek. And there's nothing weird about it. Nothing strange about it. Some man kisses me, that's strange. And they're not going to like my response. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. She kissed his feet. Kiss. It's the, the Greek word kunio. Now, in the New Testament, there are at least five or maybe more words that are... When, when the New Testament was written, it was written primarily in the Greek language. Whenever the word worship is used in the New Testament... There are about four or five different words that are used for the word, our single word, worship. They have many different words with different flavors, but yet we translate that into English, just the one word, worship. It's kind of like Hawaiians. You know, they have one word, aloha, which means hello, goodbye, and I love you. So you never know what they intend when they simply say aloha. They might want you to get out. But, you know, hey, aloha, you know. You might think, oh, you love me. No, aloha, get on out. So at least three, and am I right? Am I, oh, thank you, Melissa. She's our resident Hawaiian expert here. So if you need to know anything Hawaiian, you see that lady. So, uh, but, but we have different words for the one Hawaiian word. Well, the Greeks have many words for one English word. But whenever the word worship is translated in the New Testament, when it refers to affection or devotion or humble worship, it's primarily the word proskunio. Pros is a preposition meaning toward. Kunio is again the Greek word to kiss. And so worship, when it's heartfelt, is symbolic of somebody toward God, facing the Lord, and kissing, blowing him kisses. You know, when my, my sons were little, real little, and I would leave, bye, Daddy, Mwah! you know, they'd blow me a kiss as I was leaving for work or wherever. Oh, it just touched my heart. Now I leave and say, see ya. You know, no big deal. <laughs> but back then, it was really something special. It, it, it still is, kind of. But... That's, that's the picture Jesus wants us to understand. It's, it's proskunio. This woman kissing his feet. That's an act of worship. 
Act of reverence. Act of humility. She's not kissing his head. She's kissing his feet. Bowing down before him. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some of us are carrying around guilt. But have we worshipped Jesus like this woman did? I, I, I well imagine that if we would come to Jesus as this woman did, maybe during the, the, the last song or two that we sing, you're welcome to come out of your seat and come forward here and just kind of, you can kneel if you wish, sit on the steps if you wish, but you can come and, and, and pour out your heart to God. Just be humble before Him and worship Him. And maybe this will be your moment where the Lord takes your guilt away. When you humble, you might think, oh, people are going to think I'm weird. Who cares what people think? What matters is, is you and me getting right with the Lord and worshiping Him as He deserves. You know, it's amazing how there are some people who aren't into worship. They don't like worship. And I just wonder, what, what, why not? Now, if you don't like our music, I get it, you know. But if you don't like worship as, as a whole, as a thing, and you just, yeah, you know, I don't need to get there early or don't need to get there on time because it's just the music. I'll stroll in later. I, I just don't understand that. And frankly, I don't think the Lord understands that. Let's, let's look at this in a second. And Jesus makes this clear to Simon the self-righteous guy who thought he wasn't that big of a sinner, that who wasn't there for a worshiper, he was like, Simon, you're, you're the one at fault, not the woman. He said in verse 46, You, Simon, did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. By the way, fragrant oil and this alabaster flask, very expensive, very costly. It reminds me of what David said. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord with my God with that which costs me nothing. I'm not going to be cheap in my worship. I'm not going to just kind of sing a song and look around and just you kind of pass the time. No, I'm going to put my heart into it. Put my soul into it. I'm going to give God the glory to his name. Let me ask you a question. Does Jesus deserve our worship? I mean, that's kind of a dumb, that's kind of a duh, you know, sort of an answer. So everybody say, duh. Okay, well then let me ask you this. Do you give Jesus the worship he deserves? Do I? Do I give him my absolute best? You know what? Maybe I haven't, but from now on I will. Maybe you haven't, but how about from now on you do? Because Jesus is worthy of our absolute best. He died for us while we were sinners. A horrible, excruciating death. The the last couple of weeks, we just went through the the Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. As I was preparing for the Good Friday service especially, I was just so overwhelmed with what Jesus went through. As I read through there, just in in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 27. and and, and, And by the way, that doesn't even begin to cover all that Jesus went through. But the beatings, the torturings, the mockings, the scourging, the the beating of the crown of thorns on his head, the the humiliation as he was stripped and nailed to the cross and hung up naked in front of everybody, and plus beaten beyond recognition of even being a man. And I began to think, wow, my sin must really be bad. If that's what it took for my sins to be forgiven, then my sin must be really, really, really bad. And it is so important that we understand how bad, how awful our sins are. Because until we do, we're going to be like Simon, not appreciate Jesus. But if we'll be like the woman and understand how bad our sins truly are, then we will become the worshipers of God that God deserves. So now let's add up what this woman did and then look at Jesus' summation of her actions. Number one, she was broken, very sorry, grieved over her sins. Number two, she came to Jesus humbly, bowing at his feet. Number three, she wept and her tears washed his feet. Number four, she wiped his feet with her hair. Number five, she anointed his feet with fragrant oil and kissed them. And then Jesus adds all these things up, and now here is his summation, verse 47. Therefore, he says to Simon, I say to you, her sins, which are many, Jesus knows, 
all that we've done. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loves much. She realized how much she had sinned, how awful her sins were, but she knew that Jesus could forgive her. And therefore, she was just expressing all the love that she could in in proportion to the amount of sin that she had committed. There's the key. When we understand how much we've sinned and how much God has forgiven us, that will also correlate to how much we worship Him. See, somebody doesn't realize their sins that much, they tend to not worship God very much. Not much into it. But those who realize all that Jesus has done, man, they're into it. Show me somebody who's passionate in worship and I'll show you somebody who understands how great his or her sin was. Show me somebody who just doesn't care much about worship and I'll show you somebody who really doesn't get it. They just really don't understand all that Jesus has done. Now, Jesus used that story, the one who owed 500 denarii, the one who owed 50. And, you know, Simon may be thinking, oh, so you think that I only owed 50 and this woman owed 500 and that's why she loves much and I don't. Well, truth be told, Simon's sin was just as bad as this woman's sin. Just as heinous because Simon, he had the sin of self-righteousness. The sin of pride. The same sin that got into Lucifer's heart whereby he was kicked out of heaven and became the devil. You see, this woman, she repented. Jesus forgave her, therefore she's in heaven. Simon, he didn't repent. Didn't think he needed to. And if he never got right with God, if he didn't realize that he was a sinner and turned to Jesus by faith, He's in hell today. So who's the worst sinner? The one who comes to Jesus and is forgiven or the one who doesn't think that he or she needs forgiveness and winds up in hell? Our greatest need is forgiveness. And God's greatest attribute is the ability to forgive. In verse 48, Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Oh, I just imagine at that moment... That huge crushing weight that she had been feeling was just totally lifted from her. And I believe God wants to do that today with somebody or several people here this morning. Now, there were those who weren't interested in in getting right with Jesus, sat at the table with him, began to say to themselves, Who is this who forgives sins? Who does this guy think he is? Earlier in Luke's gospel, Jesus declared to the lame man, your sins are forgiven you. At that point, the scribes began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And you know what? They were right. Only God alone can forgive sins. But see, that's the point. Jesus was declaring himself to be God. And he proved that he is by not just dying on the cross, but three days later, rising from the dead. And therefore, whoever believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. So the naysayers, the the Simons, the prideful bad barber, they're all, who does this guy think he is that he can forgive sins? But to the woman, verse 50, he said to her, your faith has saved you. What saves you? Good works? No. Your faith has saved you. And then the next few words that are so beautiful. Go in peace. You know, it's our faith that saves us. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Once a person believes in Jesus, then they are forgiven and are able to therefore go in peace. Do you have this peace? Do you know it personally? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? If you don't, let me tell you, your sins are forgiven. If you have trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I can honestly, biblically, eternally declare to you, your sins are forgiven. Oh, but I still feel guilty. But the Lord is ready to receive your worship. He's ready to receive your humble outpouring of worship and love, and gratitude. And as you do that, 
the Lord himself will declare to you, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Would you like to do that today? Would you like to experience that today? You know, in just a moment, we're going to worship the Lord. We we still have a little bit of time. So we're going to take the next few minutes or so to worship the Lord. And during this time, if you feel like you're the woman and you feel guilty and you just want God to release you from that burden, you can get up from where you are. You can come forward here. You can stand in front. You can kneel. You can sit on the steps. Or even you can do it from your own seat if you wish. But you know, it's easy to just kind of sit in the seat and not take the step. But by taking a step, you're declaring to the Lord and everybody that you mean business. And I really believe that there are many people here that need to do business with God. You need to do business with the Lord. God is ready to deliver you. God is ready to set you free from that crushing burden if you'll come to him as this woman did. So let's have the musicians come on up here. And again, we're going to worship the Lord. And during this time, if you want to get up from your seat and come forward, you're welcome to do so. If you want to just be there in your own seats and and what have you and just come before. Harlot, okay. What did Rahab the harlot say to them? The people are in terror of the children of Israel. The people are afraid. They know that your God has given you this land. And so please, if, if, if I have shown you kindness, spare me and my family. And they said, we will do this. If you hang out this scarlet, this red cord out of your window. We, everybody else is going to be destroyed except for whoever is in this house. The scarlet cord of redemption. It's woven throughout Scripture, the blood of Jesus. And so the dread 
of the nations was already upon the people 40 years later. Now, what's really sad and pathetic, when Israel first came out of the promised land, or excuse me, out of Egypt, and they came to the border of the promised land, early on, Kadesh Barnea was a place, they sent in 12 spies. Ten of them came back with a bad report. Oh, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. They're going to squish us. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back with a great report saying, but look at the fruit. God's promised this to us. We should go in. Oh, no, we're afraid of them. No, no. The reality was is they were already afraid of Israel. And it would have been nothing for Israel to go in, even if they were short little guys in the midst of these tall NBA players. They could have gone in and destroyed them all because fear, God had already gripped them with fear that lasted for 40 years. So Israel wasted time. Why? Because they did not believe in the promise of God. We waste time, gang, when we do not believe in God's promises. But instead, look at the circumstances and allow that to dictate how we should act. God puts fear in our enemies. You will bring them in, verse 17. Plant them in the mountain of your inheritance in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. God is going to bring us to that place as well. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Oh, never get tired of hearing that, do we? Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever, and I can't wait. So Moses and Israel praised God for what He had done, who He is, and what He will do. Great elements in our worship. I heard of one pastor who said to uh, uh, his congregation, actually they have, it's a big church out in, uh, in New Mexico, Oh, it's Calvary Chapel of Albuquerque, and they had on their Facebook page, they challenged God's people to write a song of praise to the Lord. It's just a short little song, and they put it out there on the Facebook page. Whoever was part of that could send in their songs. And he said it was just amazing to see the hearts of God's people and writing these wonderful words of praise. And, uh, you know, try it. Write a song to the Lord. Write a song about, and if you can cover all three of these, what God has done, who He is, and what He's promised to do, you're going to cover all the bases. And it might just very well be a hit. You never know. Now, uh, in verse 19, to summarize, they sang the song, Four, and then the commentary was, The horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and the horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the children of Israel went on dry ground. And then uh, very quickly in verses 20 and 21, Miriam leads the women in worship. Then Miriam the prophetess, sister of Aaron, also Moses' older sister as well, took the timbrel in her hand, like a tambourine, a hand drum, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. You know, this brings up an issue. We talked about the lifting of the hands, totally appropriate, standing appropriate, kneeling, bowing. What about dancing? Can Christians dance? You know my commentary on that, right? Some can and some can't, you know? I don't know, some, sometimes, you, and, and by the way, if you, if you want to, you know, during the worship songs, the fast songs mainly, the slow ones, uh, but the fast songs, you want to move a little bit, that's perfectly fine. Now, if you're bumping into people and creating a mosh pit, then we're going to talk, you know. And if your expression somehow, some way impedes others, distracts others, then obviously you don't want to do that. But moving a little bit, go for it. I saw one lady tonight doing that. That's perfectly fine. I won't comment on the quality of it, but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Now, notice that Miriam became a worship leader for the women. And um, there are wonderful roles that women have in the church. And, of course, there's just the one role that women don't have in the church. And I won't even go there tonight. We'll deal with that some other time. Verse 21. By the way, there are some roles that men are not supposed to have in the church as well. Men are not supposed to bear children. 
And I'm perfectly fine with, with that. I, I don't want to be a child bearer. I've seen it done. <laughs> Praise God, I'm a man. Miriam answered them saying, Sing to the Lord. So sing to him again. He has triumphed gloriously. Basically, she's repeating what she's already heard what the Lord said through Moses. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider is thrown into the sea. It's interesting. She's just repeating what she's heard, but it's a fresh experience for her in the moment. I'm not looking for new revelation because there is none. When people say they have a new revelation, man, it's like warning, danger, danger, look out. You know, people that come up with these new revelations, they're, they're not true. Whatever is new, I love what Pastor Chuck Smith used to say, whatever is new is not true. Whatever is true is not new. I'm not looking for new revelation. What I am looking for are fresh new experiences with that which has always been true. Even though it was written 2,000, 5,000 years ago, Still, I can have a fresh experience. You know, as I was reading through this today, it was just fresh. It was a brand new experience with that which has always, always been true. and just really revitalized my heart and get my mind right that, man, worship's important because it's for God and he loves it when God's people worship him. He inhabits the praises of Israel, he says in the Psalms. And if he does that with Israel, how much more for the church? And so with Miriam, this fresh new experience with, with that which has already been true. That's what I pray for us. Fresh experience with that which has always been true. Hey, that's all I got. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for this night, for your grace, your mercy upon us. Lord, in your mercy, we see how you have delivered us from all of our enemies. You've overthrown them, and you uh, are preparing a place for us. You are giving us gifts and you are one day going to come personally for us and take us home to heaven. And Lord, we wonder why it's been so long, but we trust you. And, and Lord, we do know that your, your patience means the salvation of others. Lord, I pray you would teach us how to violently use the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. How to violently use these wonderful spiritual weapons in order to deliver people from the clutches of Satan and from the, the, the death sentence of sin. And so, Lord, please guide us. Give us gifts that we need in order that we might be the best bride we can be. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen.